thank you for the sponsors and inviting me uh, to talk about this really important topic in uh, not only in Parkinson's disease, but for, for all of us. Sleep, as you know, is very important. It's a very integral part of our life. You know, one quarter, one third of our life we're in sleep. And as you will see through this lecture that uh, sleep, uh, normal sleep will, will help our uh, well-being and, and abnormal sleep can affect so many uh, uh, health-related issues. Um, uh, my name is, uh, and I, I mentioned that, I, I gave this lecture earlier uh, today, so I apologize for repeating uh, myself for those who attended the first lecture, but my name, Walid al Faki, is just like John Smith, where, where I grew up. Uh, it's, um, so uh, I, I grew up in Egypt, but uh, I was actually I was born here in Texas. My dad came back in the 60s, uh, went to A&M, did his PhD, and I was born here. And... Um, when I did my residency, I did my residency at UT Southwestern here in, in, in Dallas, uh, and uh, uh, I was the chief resident of neurology at Parkland. And my senior resident was uh, from Texas. He grew up in Texas, and he was the uh, prototype Texan. He uh, wore jeans, boots, he had a cowboy hat, had a truck. We went, I used to go fishing with him, like, you know, once a month, but he goes every week. And, uh, yeah, and, and he was just the, the you know, as, as the definition would fulfill any Texan. The only thing, though, he was not born in Texas. And I kept reminding him of this all throughout years in residency. I'd tell him, I am more Texan than you. And he, that just didn't set well with him at all. But anyway, he's, we're still good friends. So... Uh, moving on, um, sleep is a, uh, I'm going to go over some sleep physiology first and then we're going to talk some more about, uh, about sleep disorders. So let's start with the definition of sleep. What is sleep? So there are several definitions of sleep. One is a behavioral definition. So uh, sleep is a condition in which there is minimal movement. It is species specific uh, and, and you know, different species will take different postures. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a condition that is characterized by poor response uh, to external stimulation and um, increased arousal threshold, and it is quickly reversible. And with that behavioral definition, we can identify sleep in microscopic uh, creatures like nematodes, for example. Um, so they go through these stages of, they call it a stage of fatigue, followed by a stage of movement. We can identify this in bees. For example, this wild bee here is, is attaching to this little twig with its jaw, so they attach to it, and then they will go into this period of decreased activity that can be easily reversible. Sleep is fascinating in birds and in fish, in things like dolphin. They have this unihemispheric sleep. So one hemisphere will, as will be asleep and the other one is active during flying or during swimming. Um, and sleep also in some species, you know, hibernating species like the polar bears, for example, they can go on for a long time in a state of sleep as defined by these behavioral definitions. And it is interesting in animals, you, you'd find that Herbivores, for example, will sleep a little because they have to be awake for a long time to gather a lot of plants to build up on their activity and to supply themselves with the calories needed. While uh, carnivores, for example, like you know, lions and things like that, they really don't need to wake up a lot. They can sleep you know, 16 hours and then go hunt a deer and eat it and they get all the calories that last them for a week. So, so that's really interesting in, in some how the food and our behavior can, um, can, go with, uh, can interfere with our sleep. The electrophysiological definition, this is what we use as sleep doctors and neurologists and physicians to define sleep. So when we measure the uh, electrical activity of the brain, when we do an electroencephalogram, an electroencephalogram is like the EKG like, that we've all had. It's basically we put electrodes on the head, and then we record the electrical activity coming out of the brain. And when you look at the, uh, the EEG, in, uh, in the awake state, 
the EEG is fast. We basically count these little tiny, uh, ampli these little tiny potentials. We see how many of these little tiny potentials one will have per second. And we give that a number and a name. So for example, uh, uh, when it's like 8 to 12 hertz, 8 to 12 per second, we call this alpha rhythm. When it is less than that, we call it theta rhythm and so on. So in awake, the awake rhythm is about in that alpha range, 8 to 12 per second. As we get drowsy, this will start to slow down. We start to get what we call theta rhythm. That's in, in the range of about, about 4 to 7 hertz or so. And then as we go deeper into sleep, we start to see these specific electroencephalographic activities, sleep spindles, and we see these large amplitude electrical waveforms where they call them K-complexes, and that we know that we're now into stage two sleep. And then when we get into deep sleep or stage three sleep, you can see, you can definitely see how, how much this is much different than stage one sleep and wakefulness. This is large amplitude, slow wave sleep, but we can get one or two of those large electrical activity waveforms per second. And that's why we, how we know that we are into stage sleep, three sleep. And then after that, we go into REM sleep. REM sleep is rapid eye movement sleep. So this is a state of sleep. This is an active state of sleep. Our brain, look at, look at the brain activity during that. This is the brain activity during REM sleep. It looks pretty much like being awake. It is very active. So there's a lot that happens during REM sleep. This is the dream sleep. This is where we think a lot of memory consolidation happen, as I'm going to talk about this later down uh, in the talk. And, and this is where the difference between this and wakefulness really is muscle activity. So during REM sleep, we, our muscles are paralyzed. We have no muscle tone, OK? except for the muscles of breathing and the muscles of the eye, the eye movement muscles. But other than that, this is a stage where muscles are almost paralyzed and not moving. And it may have happened to you that someone wakes you up during REM sleep, and for a fraction of a second, you feel like you cannot move, like you're paralyzed. So that may happen sometimes. And there are some disorders in which people will wake up during REM sleep and they will have this sleep paralysis. And it can be a very annoying and very frightening uh, condition. And then, so this is, this is how we define sleep according to the electrical activity in the brain. And we find that sleep follows a certain transition. So we go from stage one sleep to stage two to deep sleep, stage three sleep, and then we go to REM sleep. And each one of these cycles take about, we start with about, the first cycle take about 90 minutes. So on average, it takes about 90 minutes to get to the first REM sleep. And then these cycles starts to get shorter and shorter in duration as the night goes on. In the first half of the night, we get more and more of deep sleep. And in the latter half of the night, we get more and more of REM sleep. So first half, we get more deep wave sleep, latter, Night, uh, later in the night, we get more of the REM sleep. And this is the kind of the normal sleep pattern that we understand from sleep studies and so on. As we go on and we talk about sleep disorders, you will find that this pattern gets disturbed in patient Parkinson's disease and in patients with other conditions. So now that we finished the definition of sleep, what is sleep? Now we're going to talk about, okay, how do we sleep, okay? So there are, um, there are some, uh, there are several uh, uh, ways of answering that question. One is this two-process model. So what is that two-process model? We think that there are two processes working, kind of antagonizing each other, and the product of these two processes is what gets us to sleep. So there is one process called the homeostatic drive, and the other is called the circadian drive. The homeostatic drive is basically the tendency to sleep. So as soon as we wake up in the morning, the brain starts to work on sleep. So as we go on through the day, there is this build up of a drive for us to go back to sleep. 
And we think that this drive, or this is driven by a certain chem chemical transmitter called adenosine. Okay, so as we go on through the night, there is an accumulation of this adenosine, and it goes up and up and up, and with it, with the, the more that we accumulate that, the more that we feel the tendency of going to sleep. And this is antagonized, or, or, or another process that works against that, is the circadian drive. So as soon as we wake up in the morning, we have the circadian drive that drives us to stay awake. And that drive to stay awake kind of works against the drive to get us asleep. So until we get to a point where the, the homeostatic drive is at its peak, the circadian drive it is um, uh, at its valley and then, or at its nadir, and at this point, this is what we call the sleep gate, right? So at 8, 9, 10 p.m., the homeostatic drive at its peak, we have, you know, the brain has been accumulating this adenosine all day long, and you really need to go sleep. And the circadian rhythm, the, the, or the circadian drive, what has been making you wake up all day long, is at its lowest. So this is the sleep window. Now, we do many things, and there are a lot of physiological things that happen during the day that interfere with this process. And the kind of the, the, the sum of all of these activities is what really determines our sleep. Um, you know, when do we go to sleep and when do we wake up and how long do we sleep and so on. So, for example, coffee is in caffeinated beverage, it, coffee is in, it is an, uh, an adenos, uh, adenosine antagonist, okay? or it blocks the receptors for adenosine. So that's why when you drink coffee, you are basically, you are de delaying or dec decreasing this homeostatic drive. So adenosine is, is accumulating in your, in your brain, you feel like you wanna sleep, you drink coffee, it stops or it blocks the effect of that adenosine, and that what kind of makes us feel awake and alert and want us, you know, to stay up longer. So that's one effect, for example, that we get uh, or, or how we can manipulate this, this process. The other is the circadian rhythm. Now, the circadian rhythm is, is, just, is just fascinating how, how it works. We know that there is, a, there is a group of neurons right behind the eye here in, in, a, in a small structure called the hypothalamus, the supraoptic nucleus. The supraoptic nucleus has these, this is, we think, this is where the biological clock is. This is the central biological clock of the body. And, and what it does is, this, this supraoptic nucleus receives information from the light. It receives information through the eye, so the, the, the light falls on the eyes. It, the, the, it, it creates a signal in the retina, an electrical signal, that goes through a pathway to that group of nuclei. So when this supraoptic nucleus receives this electrical uh, information coming in from the eye that there is light, this supraoptic nucleus is kind of like the maestro. It sends signals to multiple areas, mainly in the midbrain and the brain stem, to enhance wake-promoting chemicals and wake-promoting activity. So basically, a signal goes from it to all these centers here. So okay, let's go ahead and produce all these neurotransmitters, things like dopamine and histamine and serotonin and norepinephrine and all these neurochemical transmitters that are important for wakefulness. Um, and then, as the light dims when we go through the night and there is not enough light and there is decreased light input through the eye, then that supraoptic nucleus realizes, okay, it is dim out there. I'm not getting as much stimulus through that pathway. So it sends other set of, of information through some very interesting and very complicated pathways that can go all the way down to the spinal cord and all the way up to the mammillary body where it, it and the pineal gland to to produce melatonin. And melatonin, when it comes out, then this is kind of the neurotransmitter for 
sleepiness. So as the brain sees, okay, a lot of melatonin surge coming up, it realizes that it's time to sleep. And another set of neurotransmitters like gabapentin, for example, uh, and glycine and so on, these neurotransmitters get produced and we start to go into this, you know, this sleep uh, electrical activity that we, we talked about earlier. So this is what, what we think, or this is how we think we sleep. And you can imagine by understanding this physiology, this, these physiological changes, a lot of things that we do can interfere with our sleep. And I only said light, but there are a lot of other stimuli and in, that in, and information gets to our brain that will determine and will affect our sleep-wake cycle. Things about, you know, what time do we eat, our exercise, our social interaction, all of these things. So you can imagine, you know, if you're up at night at midnight and looking at a light-emitting source like your phone or your iPad or watching, you know, a very bright TV or something like that, then that will interfere with your sleep, right? And vice versa, if you, during the day you are sitting in a dark room, quiet, not really engaged in any activity, that's why you can get excessive daytime sleepiness and you, you become you know, sleepy and, and tired during the day. So, so all of these things can affect it. And it is, it is a fascinating area, you know, the, the, the last, um, uh, Nobel uh, uh, Prize for Physiology was for the, you know, the, the scientists that discovered actually the circadian rhythm and how it works. Almost every cell in the body, all cells in the heart and liver and intestines and all over the body, they have an internal clock. And these internal clocks are, work through genes in the cells that produce proteins. And those proteins get pr produced, they go out of the cell, they accumulate out of the cell, and then they stop their own production. And that cycle goes on and on again. And that cycle goes in sync with that cycle that goes on in the supraoptic nucleus. And you can imagine from that any disturbance in that supraoptic nucleus and in that rhythm can affect multiple areas uh, in the body. So it's, it's, it's really a, a fascinating area. And one of the important things also that the circadian rhythm does is that it tries to entrain our sleep-wake cycle to the day and night cycle. So the, our, our biological clock is a little bit slightly uh, more than 24 hours, about 24.2 hours uh, or 24.18 hours difference from man to woman. And, and all of this activity that we do and all that that biological clock is trying to do is trying to entrain our cycle with the day and light cycle. And that's why, for example, people who have dim vision, you know, blind people who cannot see, uh, people who have been isolated from light for a long time, they can go into this non 24 hour cycle where they just sleep and wake and sleep and wake and sleep and wake in, in, in different times and hours that are not related to the, to the light and dark. So anyway, fascinating things that can come out of the circadian rhythm and understanding this can help us understand a lot of the sleep disorders that, uh, that we can deal with. So <clears throat> I'm not going to belabor you with this. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of, of, of neurochemistry that happens to, to help us sleep. There are a lot of, of sleep-promoting chemical transmitters and a lot of, of uh, wakeful-promoting neurotransmitters. I just want to get your attention to the fact that most of these neurotransmitters are produced in the area of the midbrain, the hypothalamus midbrain, brainstem, these are the areas that are affected in patients with Parkinson's disease, in patients with other neurodegenerative diseases that, that uh, present with symptoms similar to Parkinson's disease. So no wonder why, when we have these degenerative processes that lead to Parkinson's disease, we can see that there are disturbance in sleep, the sleep-wake cycle, and we get a lot of sleep disorders with it. Be, just because of the, 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 the degenerative processes that are happening, happen in the kind of the same vicinity, in the same area. And, and a lot of these centers that are, that are involved in sleep can also be affected in uh, patient Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonian-related disorders. So 
sleep through the ages, we, our sleep differs through the ages. Uh, in general, we have pretty much, we maintain the same sleep distribution until our mid-40s where we start our slow wave sleep starts to come down as well as our REM sleep. And the waking up after REM uh, or after sleep uh, onset starts to increase. And the duration for sleep, as you can see, goes from an, you know, the infant sleeping 18 hours a day all the way down to adults sleeping seven hours or more a day. And the consensus is, is that seven hours is probably the right amount to fall to, for, for sleep. This is the right amount of sleep duration. Less than that could be sleep deprivation. More than that, it's fine, but we try, our goal is to reach that seven hours. Now, there are exceptions to every rule. Some people may feel completely refreshed and, and uh, re-energized with six hours, six and a half hours. But in general, this is the consensus. Some epidemiologic studies have been sh shown that patients who sleep you know, chronically or consistently less than seven hours uh, can have increased uh, morbidities and, and so on. So, so that's, the, 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 that's what's about sleep duration. Now, so wh why, do you sleep? why do we sleep? So there are a lot of, lot of very important uh, metabolic and physiological processes occurring during sleep. So um, we preserve energy during sleep, 30% or so of reduction in cerebral uh, energy consumption. Uh, we replenish a lot of these neurotransmitters that we use throughout the day uh, during sleep. We, there is removal of toxic waste, a lot of broken proteins and broken chemicals that happen during the day get removed at night. Um, endocrine functions, a lot of hormones are dependent on sleep. Things like growth hormone, for example, prolactin, these are sleep-dependent uh, hormones, so they come out only when we are asleep in certain stages of sleep. So if you're sleep deprived, then there will be, that will affect the production of these hormones. So in kids, for example, that you know, have sleep problems for some reason, they don't sleep well, that can actually affect their growth hormone and then they can you know, have problems with growing and so on. Um, and sleep is really very important for memory. Memory, we think that a memory, uh, um, basically, you know, learning, um, and then uh, you learn through the day, and then during sleep, um, basically, you consolidate that memory, that what you learn through the day, and then you can retrieve them afterwards. And so, the sleep is really very important for memory. We think that all the things, all the things that you go through through the day, all the, the experiences that you do, all the, the, the talks that you've had and, and, the, and the errands that you run through the day, all of this gets consolidated when you go to sleep. So whatever is useful and important gets, stays in there and what, the, the things that are not important gets you know, thrown away. And so you get and, and it, depending on the, the, the type of sleep that you have, so for example, in slow wave sleep, you get um, more of the, of the uh, 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 factual memories get stored during that. So, you know, the fact that you, you know, I have a lecture today at one o'clock, so that have to be put in there, you know, it, during slow wave sleep. These are facts that have to be there that you, you, you need to consolidate and keep in there. And then some of the non-factual memories, things like, you know, you know, how to drive coming here, or how, how to give this lecture, or how to, how to use this clicker that I have, and things like that. These are kind of, these are not factual memories, these are things that you learn, uh, you know, by experience and so on. All of these things get consolidated during that time. And no wonder why that sleep disorders can affect our cognitive function and can affect our memory and, and retention and recall and so on. And that's why, for example, patients with obstructive sleep apnea, we see that uh, those who have controlled sleep apnea do better than the ones that have poor sleep apneas, for example, in patients with Alzheimer's disease. So you take a patient with, with dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and have sleep apnea. If it's not good, if it's not well controlled, those patients seem to deteriorate much faster and much worse than the ones that have controlled uh, uh, apnea. So, so sleep is, is definitely integral and very important for, uh, for memory. 
Sleep is also important for immune function. A lot of the chemicals, the interleukins and the tumor necrosis factors and things, things that chemicals that the immune system produce to fight infection and, and to do surveillance, all of these things get produced during sleep. And again, if you have sleep deprivation, if you have poor quality sleep, poor quantity sleep, then you will have poor production of these factors. And then those patients can be more liable for infections. Um, you know, experiments have shown, for example, that sleep deprived people have uh, lower reaction to vaccines. You know, the, their immune system is not powerful enough to mount that reaction to a vaccine and so on. So all of these things are important to, to keep in mind when uh, uh, about sleep. So having talked about all of this, um, then it, is, it makes sense that you know, if someone has a sleep problem, sleep disorder, then you can, ex whether it is poor sleep quality or poor sleep quantity or both, then you, know, you can get problems with irritability, with cognitive impairment, with, uh, with memory lapses, with the problems with judgment, uh, with uh, you know any you know a lot of a lot of it affects a lot of factors. Patients with sleep deprivation can have problems with their uh, met metabolism. For example, uh, sleep deprived uh, patients will have uh, increased production of ghrelin. Ghrelin is a hormone that imp that that makes you feel hungry, makes you want to eat more, and it stores what you eat. So that's why uh, obesity and, 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 and weight loss is difficult in patients with, with sleep deprivation or poor sleep in general. Um, and, uh, and on the contrary, on the other side, you know, patients who sleep well produce another uh, hormone called leptin, and then that can help them lose weight and, or at least not, not gain weight and so on. So, um, and they're, they're ex you know, uh, experiments have been done, they will get two groups of people, they will sleep deprived some and the others will let them sleep through the night and then the next morning they'll give them like an open buffet style uh, uh, breakfast and they find the sleep deprived people will go to the fried food and the donuts and the, you know, and the, the unhealthy uh, uh, choices while the one that sleep, slept well will go to the fruits and the yogurt and the, uh, you know, the low calorie uh, diet and so on. So all of these things are, uh, happen with sleep deprivation. That's why patients with chronic sleep problems can develop you know, diabetes, can develop a metabolic syndrome. Uh, they also can develop cardiovascular problems from uh, there is a there are pro patients again with sleep problems will have problems in their uh, cardiac uh, heart rate rhythm and variability and blood pressure control and all of these things over time can cause cardiovascular problems. When it comes to Parkinson's disease, patient you know a lot of muscle. Uh, activity, there's a lot of, you know, we, we get through sleep, it is a time where, you know, the muscle tone changes and gets relaxed and so on. So patients with, uh, say for example, sleep, uh, sleep problems will have increased tremors, will have increased fatigue and increased muscle spasticity and so on, and that can definitely interferes and get actually more amplified in patients with Parkinson's disease. So as you can see, and Sleep really affects almost every system in the body. Um, sleep and pain, for example, that's, that's a, an, another important point. They did these experiments where they do, they will test pain thresholds. So they'll get volunteers and they, you know, whatever, put some pressure on you and they will calculate, okay, how much of pressure needed until you say, ouch, until it is, it is painful, right? And then they will sleep deprive these volunteers and then they will test that again. And then they will find that these threshold gets lower, that you will start to experience pain at a much lesser threshold than when you, when you slept well. So sleep deprivation is, you know, can lower pain threshold and that's important in patients who have chronic pain or patients who have pain associated with muscle spasms and rigidity and so on. So if they don't sleep well, that pain is going to get worse or at least they will, feel, uh, they will feel it worse. So having said all of that, then the, you know, what are the sleep disorders? So the international classification of sleep disorders put these six categories of, of sleep disorders and uh, I don't think they've ever thought that someone will, will take their classification and put these uh, pictures to it. 
But I, I think they are representative. So insomnia, you know, difficulty sleeping, whether it's difficulty initiating sleep or maintaining sleep or both. And insomnia in the new classification is classified as acute and chronic insomnia. In old classifications, they went into different types of insomnia, things like you know, psychophysiological insomnia that is caused by an anxiety. They went into things like paradoxical insomnia, meaning you know, insomnia that, um, that patients will you know, sleep misperception, the patients think that they're insomnic or not. Uh, they talked about uh, uh, set limiting insomnia, like patients, for example, this is more in kids, you know, uh, the kids will tell you, you know, you, you put the kid to, your, to sleep and they will come up with like a hundred different things like, well, read me a story and I want some water and it's too hot and it's too dark and I, you know, uh, will, you know, will sit next to me and so on. This is, this actually leads to chronic insomnia in kids. So anyway, so the old classification had multiple types of insomnia, now we limit them to just acute and chronic insomnia. Sleep-related uh, breathing disorders, that will include things like snoring, obstructive sleep apnea, central apnea, obesity, hypoventilation syndrome. There's a lot of things that can affect the breathing during sleep, and, uh, and that's included in this section. Uh, central disorders of hypersomnia, that's the, the opposite of the insomnia. Those are the patients that have excessive sleepiness during the day. The classic disease process is that it's narcolepsy, and, and uh, narcolepsy can be with and without cataplexy. Cataplexy is this sudden loss of muscle tone where pe patients can suddenly lose muscle tone and fall in, 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 in attacks, especially you know, with surprises or, um, or with you know, emotionality. Um, the excessive daytime somnolence or sleepiness is common in patient Parkinson's disease, so they, they have some of that. Um, parasomnias, these are the abnormal behaviors through the night, so sleepwalking, sleep talking, uh, uh, things like uh, REM behavior disorder, which is, can be seen in patients with Parkinson's disease. And um, so anyway, these are called the parasomnias. The circadian rhythm disorders are, these include things like sleep shift uh, abnormalities, so advanced sleep shift, like those are the people that want to go to bed at 4 or 5 in the afternoon and then wake up at 1 or 2 in the morning and they've done their sleep and then they start calling their friends and their families, hey, what are you guys up to? And like, it's 2 in the morning, you know? Um, so that's you know, sleep advanced. And then there's, there's delayed sleep shift syndrome. That's more of our teenagers. They want to stay up till 3 and 4 in the morning. And then they want to sleep till, you know, noon or 1 o'clock. And they can't, you know, you wake them up to go to school at 7. And they're like, you know, uh, we didn't, I only slept for two hours. So, so that's an advanced sleep shift. In that category also, there's the jet lag category. There's the, the sleep, um, the uh, uh, sleep shift disorders, so people who work at nights, for example. So there's a lot of, uh, there's the non-24 hour syndrome or the non-entrained form. This is again patients who are, you know, blind or have decreased visual input that they will have no control or they don't know when, you know, time to wake up and when to sleep. So anyway, a lot, multi, a lot of disorders in that category. And the last one is the sleep-related movement disorders. The common, you know, the commonly known would be things like restless leg syndrome, patients who are just having this excessive leg movements through the night that they cannot get any relief unless they stand up, get out of bed and walk around. Uh, periodic leg movements of sleep, sleep tremors. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of uh, also other things in that category and patient Parkinson's disease have some of, some of these also. So how do we evaluate a patient with sleep disorder? Well, you start with, you know, uh, the good old history and physical exam. You talk to the patient and say, okay, tell me what's going on. You know, tell me about your sleep. When do you go to sleep? When do you wake up? How many hours do you stay in bed? Uh, do you feel refreshed when you wake up in the morning or not? Do you feel sleepy? Do you nap? Do you have uh, sleep attacks? Do you, uh, what kind of behavior you have through the night? You know, do you leg kicks? Do you snore? Do you stop breathing? just get a history about, uh, about their, their sleep habits. And then do your neurological examination and the general physical exam. We do neck circumferences, for example. You know, uh, men that have a neck circumference more than 17 inches 
or women that have more than 15 inches have increased risk of obstructive sleep apnea. We look in their throat and we look at see how you know, big of a space they have in the back of their throat, the, the lower the space, the more likelihood that they have sleep apnea, for example, and so on. So we just do a, you know, a general examination. We use questionnaires, things like the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, for example. It, it's a questionnaire that asks you, what are the chances for you to doze off or fall asleep if, you know, when you're reading, when you're watching TV, when you're talking to someone, when you're driving, you know, zero is no chance, one is a mild, two is a moderate, and three is a, is a, is a high chance. And then if you score 10 or more on that, that screening test uh, or that scale, that tells us that you are sleepy. It really doesn't make a diagnosis, but it just tells you that you are sleepy, and then that can be uh, you know, a way to start to look into why you're sleepy. Is it is it because you, you have you know, problems with sleep quality, quantity, or both? Uh, or you're on medications that make you sleepy and so on. So anyway, there, there are a lot of these, you know, uh, scales. There are other scales to look for things like insomnia and also sleep apnea and so on. We use uh, sleep diaries. So we ask patients to put in there, you know, like for example here, this patient, you know, went to sleep from seven to eight and from midnight to four, and then uh, this patient, uh, you know, ended up. Uh, waking up and sleeping again from seven to nine, something like that. So we asked the patient to fill up these sleep questionnaires and bring them the next time we see them and we look at three, four weeks of sleep and that will give us an idea about pattern. We use these quite a bit when we want to diagnose patients with uh, you know, the, the, those circadian rhythm disorders, the advanced sleep shift and the delayed sleep shift and so on. And patients with insomnia, for example, uh, those, those are very helpful to, to use. Um, we check labs as needed, you know, thyroid function is important to know in patients who have insomnia. If you have hyperthyroidism, for example, that will make you have problems sleeping. We check uh, ferritin level, it's the iron content in the body, basically, to see if it's low. A lot of patients with low serum ferritin levels will have restless leg movements and periodic leg movements and uh, disorder. So that's important to check and, and to correct. Uh, if we need to. Um, and then um, we do tests, different tests to help us diagnose the sleep disorder. So we can do things like actigraphy. This is a watch that basically detects movement and day and light and, 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 and basically it tells us and it gives us graphs like this one here that you know this is time of activity and this is time of no activity. So with it, we can see these kind of give us somewhat objective evaluation of the patient's activity. When do they sleep or when do they move? And that will tell us, you know, um, a little bit about their sleep. Um, and we do sleep studies in the lab and out of the lab. So we can do home sleep studies. These are simple uh, uh, devices. We give it to the patient. They, it measures their oxygen, measures their chest wall movement, uh, and it measures their, their heart rate and measures their flow. And basically, it gives us an idea about this patient. Is, are they breathing well or not? Are they stopping breathing? Do they have sleep apnea? Do they, uh, do, do, does their oxygen level go down? So this is a nice screening test that you can do for someone who you're suspecting might have sleep apnea. If, but it will not help you, under, you know, see if the patient has abnormal movements, for example. Or it will not help you know what kind of sleep this patient is having. Are they having REM sleep or slow wave sleep or sleep fragmentation? So a, that's what we, why we do an in-lab study. So an in-lab study is a more comprehensive study. We, we basically attach the patient to an EEG, uh, the electroencephalogram. We do an EOG, which is an electro electrooculogram. We put some electrodes around the eyes to detect eye movements. We put snoring microphones. We put... Uh, we put basically things to detect. Sometimes we don't need the snoring microphone, but <laughs> it's quite obvious, but, but we do that. We put um, nasal uh, flow uh, uh, sensors to tell us about if there is any flow, air flow going through uh, the nose or not. We put chin uh, EMGs to detect any chin movements that are helpful in detecting patients with bruxism. For example, patients that bite down when they're asleep. It will also help us know if the patient is 
you know, uh, having muscle tone that is normal during REM or not. Uh, we have chest belts and abdominal belts, those to detect the movement, the chest movement and abdominal wall movement during breathing, and it will tell us whether the patient is, you know, having, getting the signal from their brain to move these muscles actually and breathe or not. Um, we have oxygen monitors, we have EKG to detect the heart rhythm and heart rate. We have EMGs, electrodes that we put on the legs to detect the muscle activity. It will tell us whether there's some you know, movement or not. So after you're hooked up, you're like a scuba diver. You have all things hooked up to you, and we lead you to a bed, usually a comfortable bed, not like a hospital bed. You go in there and you try to sleep, and we also use video to record any abnormal movements during the sleep. Most people would say, oh, I would never sleep but after being hooked up that way. Most people sleep well with no problems, and they easily get used to uh, all these things that are connected to them. And we monitor that, and basically we get a we get information on a, on a graph form. So here, for example, this is kind of the raw data that we get from all these connections. So here we get the EEG, the electroencephalogram. That's the one that will tell us about the type of sleep that this patient is having. Is it, you know, stage one, two, or three, or REM sleep? This is the extraoculogram. This is the one that shows us the eye movements that you can see over here. So you can see these high amplitude activities. So that tells us that this patient is his eyes are moving and his EEG looks like someone who's awake and we look at the chin EMG and we see that it's flat meaning that there is no muscle tone so this is how we conclude for example that this patient is in REM sleep at this particular point okay and then we look at their heart rate we look at their sleep the 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 uh, the sleep volume or sleep effort through the chest and abdominal belts so this is the flow going through the nose, this is the chest and the abdominal belt. So if we find that this becomes flat while this is still going on, that tells us there is some obstruction. Or if we find that all these three lines are flat, it tells us that this patient, that there is really no signal that came from the brain to tell the patient to sleep at this point. And these, these we call each one of those a 30 second of this information, we call it an epoch. And we score these epochs 30 seconds at a time. We look at it, and we look at every one of them. We'd say, OK, what stage of sleep this is? Is this stage one, two, or three, or REM sleep? Or the patient's awake? Is there any leg movement? Is there any abnormalities on that 30 seconds? We, uh, we score it. And that eventually gives us the report for the sleep study, tells us exactly how long the patient sleep, what type of sleep they've had, whether they stopped breathing or not, do they snore, do they move their legs, do they kick. The, gives us a lot of information about this, and with it, we'd be able to make a diagnosis. So, so this is, so far, this was kind of introduction into the sleep physiology, how do we sleep, what kind of, you know, what's how important sleep is. And now we're going to shift and talk specifically about sleep in Parkinson's disease. So when, when you survey patients with Parkinson's disease, sleep problems come very high on their, their, the things that they report that bother them about the disease and their dissatisfaction of the disease. So it probably comes next to the motor problems with Parkinson's disease, the tremor, the difficulty walking, the rigidity, and so on. Sleep problems probably come next after that. So there's a lot of sleep problems in Parkinson's disease. And those can include disrupted sleep, unrefreshing sleep, uh, waking up in the middle of the night, no, frequent waking, and difficulty falling asleep. So these are common problems that we see in, in patients with Parkinson's disease. And surveys have shown that up to 90% of patients with Parkinson's disease will have some sort of a sleep problem. And as, if you compare that to general population, like here, for example, the National uh, Sleep Foundation make these surveys, they found that you know, about 12% or so of the, of the general population have poor sleep, or, and 23% and, you know, say that it's only fair. So compare that to the 90% of patient Parkinson's disease that will have you know, the complaint of sleep problems. So what kind of sleep problems that we can see in Parkinson's disease? You can see 
a lot of sleep problems affecting different domains. So a lot of patients will, will so insomnia, you know, difficulty initiating sleep or difficulty maintaining sleep or both, okay? Sleep fragmentation, meaning you're sleeping through the night, but you're just not getting any deep, continuous sleep. It is, it is interrupted by multiple awakenings. Uh, parasomnias, things like, you know, uh, sleepwalking, sleep talking, and the REM behavior disorder, which is acting out dreams. Uh, hypersomnia, which is excessive daytime sleepiness, is, is very common in patient Parkinson's disease. Could be, and we'll go over this in more detail. Um, circadian rhythm disturbances, the, the advanced sleep shift that we talked about. Uh, uh, medications can cause problems, whether insomnia or hypersomnia or excessive sleepiness. And uh, comorbid problems, a lot of patients with Parkinson's disease will have other problems going on, you know, things like, you know, depression and anxiety, uh, heart disease, uh, or, or, or other illnesses that may affect their sleep. So, Moving on, we'll talk about insomnia and Parkinson's disease. So insomnia seems to be the most common problem in patients with Parkinson's disease. And this type of insomnia could be both sleep initiation insomnia or sleep maintenance insomnia. And one of the important causes of insomnia in patients with Parkinson's disease is the motor symptoms. So patients with Parkinson's disease can have tremors during sleep or continue to have tremors. And that's really more in sleep transitions, like as they, as they go from drowsiness to stage one sleep or from stage one to stage two sleep. In between these transitions, tremors can come up and these tremors can actually be, uh, can lead to poor sleep. Um, Problems turning in bed, very common in patients with Parkinson's disease, and can lead to significant insomnia. And, and it is really, it is a very aggravating symptom to the patient with Parkinson's disease. Um, things like uh, uh, dystonia, uh, you know, abnormal movements during, during sleep, um, stiffness, uh, restlessness, all of these things can lead to problems sleeping through the night and interfere with either sleep initiation or sleep maintenance or both. Um, other things that can happen and that lead to insomnia during uh, for patient Parkinson's disease would be nocturia, you know, going to the bathroom at night, hallucinations, as well as an anxiety and, and depression. So how, how do we treat this? Uh, we try to identify what's, what's the cause of the insomnia, what's, what is the main thing that is leading to this problem. So if it's the motor symptoms, we, f for example, we add long-acting uh, uh, carbidopa, levodopa at night, you know, like uh, Cinemet CR, for example. We put that at night so it can, the patient can have some of that dopamine effect throughout the night that can help control some of these motor symptoms. Um, and um, we optimize the Parkinson treatment in general. We just go over the medications again and see what we can do to, to optimize the treatment throughout the night. If it's an anxiety and, and, and depression, one of the things that help a lot in patient Parkinson's disease is, and not just Parkinson's disease, but in insomnia in general, is cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. So. Remember, I, I mentioned the, in the previous classification, we talked that, you know, there are so many types of insomnia. One of the commonest types of insomnia is something called psychophysiological insomnia, in which patients kind of go into this vicious circle. They have problems sleeping, then, you know, they, during the day they feel stressed and anxious and tired, okay? And that actually creates an, an anxiety about sleep itself. So as soon as they go to bed, that an anxiety gets exaggerated and they cannot go to bed because of that. And they just go into this vicious circle. So one of the things that we can do to address this is to do something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or CBTI. And in, 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 in CBTI, the patient will learn things about relaxation techniques, we'll learn things, you know, about sleep, proper sleep hygiene, uh, proper sleep habits, uh, do things, you know, we'll teach them things about sleep restriction, for example, is, you know, uh, some people will go to bed at 8 at night and, and wake up at 10 in the morning, and, you know, th there's no need to be in bed for all that time 
14 hours, and you don't need to do that. You only need seven hours. Those are the ones that you need to be in bed and to fill those with sleep as much as we can. Now, if you fill those seven hours, we'll go to eight hours, nine hours. But there's no point in staying in bed for 10, 11, 12 hours and then ending up sleeping, you know, half of that. We do things like stimulus control. So if you're in bed and you've been tossing and turning for 30 minutes or so, you need to leave the bedroom and go elsewhere in the house, sit in a comfortable room, uh, dim lights, uh, and don't do anything stimulating. Don't you know, watch TV, don't read from an iPad, don't you know, run errands. No, try to, again, do something relaxing, find a, a book, preferably a boring book, something that's not going to be interesting, and just kind of, you know, go through the monotony of that, or, you know, listen to soft music, or do some meditation, or, you know, anything that, that kind of make you relax to kind of, and if you feel sleepy, you go back to bed again. And then you have to stick to the time that you determine for yourself to wake up. So if it is at 7 in the morning, you have to wake up at 7 in the morning, even if you had a sleepless night, even if you didn't really sleep well that night, because that will create what we call a sleep debt that will carry on with you, and hopefully the next night you will sleep better. And I tell my patients that, you know, our normal physiology is sleep. So as, as you remember that first, you know, that, that two-stage uh, process, you know, remember that homeostatic process, the minute we woke up, our brain is, is, is working on trying to sleep. Now, we do things through our life, whether it is sleep habits, whether it's medications, whether it's caffeinated beverage, a lot of things, and anxiety, depression, all of these things are the things that are interfering and stopping that brain physiology, that normal brain physiology from getting back in action. So all we need is to just to clear these things out of, of, out of our homeostatic drive and, and, and let it sleep. And I tell, you know, I tell my patients, you can, you've never, you know, you may have heard of people that went, go on uh, hunger strike, right? They go on hunger strike for weeks and months. You never hear about someone goes on sleep strike. You know, in fact, that's one of the cognitive behavior therapy techniques. They will tell patients with chronic insomnia, they say, okay, you know what? Go to bed and try not to sleep. Okay? I mean, just actively try not to sleep. Okay? Don't use external things. I mean, don't, you know, drink coffee in bed and say, yes, I'll take your challenge. I'm not going to go to sleep. Right? Yeah. But, but yeah, go in and try not to go to sleep. Okay? Don't, don't do external stimuli. And just stay up all night. See if you can do it. And, you know, patients can do this once or twice. They will end up sleeping. And that actually can break that barrier. In, especially in patients with chronic insomnia, they'll say, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm never going to sleep again. It's, you know, sleep is impossible. I'm not ever going to do that. So sometimes we do that. We say, okay, yes, go to bed, get ready. You know, don't watch TV. Don't look at light emitting sources, what have you. Just, yeah, and stay there up. Stay, don't, don't sleep. Try not to sleep. So anyway, so, so it, is, um, it, it is important to realize that, that, you know, um, that with cognitive behavior therapy can help quite a bit on these issues. And studies have shown that CBTI is better than, is as good or better than hypnotics, than medications to help with insomnia. And the effect of CBTI is more uh, kind of last longing effect. Uh, so, so anyway, so we, patients, with our, when they come to us with chronic insomnia, we definitely try CBTI. And the American Academy of Sleep Medicine recommends, the guidelines recommend that this is really the first line of intervention in patients with chronic insomnia, that you should start with CBTI. Now, uh, medications that you can use, you can consider using, you know, things sedating uh, and exolytics and antidepressants, things like trazodone and, uh, and mirtazapine. Those medications can help with an anxiety and depression that is frequently associated with chronic insomnia and Parkinson's disease and can also help sleep through the night. If a problem with sleep maintenance insomnia, for example, we can use doxepen, which is an, an, a tricyclic antidepressant that can help with sleep. Um, and try to avoid Avoid long-acting hypnotics, things like Ambien CR, Lonesta, benzodiazepines, things like clonazepam, which we use a lot on, in, in Parkinson's disease, but it, it lingers quite a bit. It can, the half-life can go up to 18, 20 hours. And the problem with these medications is that you take them, 
They stay on board. You wake up in the middle of the night, you want to go to the bathroom, then you fall. Okay, so, so we try not to use these medications, uh, try to avoid them. If we need to use a hypnotic, we want to use something that is very short acting, uh, and those can definitely help. Um, uh, try to avoid antihistamines, over-the-counter medications. All of these things have Benadryl in it, and they actually they don't induce good sleep. They increase the, the, the stage two sleep, and they suppress stage three sleep and REM sleep. And you know, people will wake up feeling groggy and tired, and and they can cause confusion and so on. So, so these are medications that you you probably best to to avoid. All right, excessive daytime somnolence. So. Um, this is very common patient Parkinson's disease, and it is possibly because of uh, you know poor fragmented sleep. Uh, and I, I don't think I yes, like here. This is this is an example of fragmented sleep. So remember, we talked about the sleep cycle, how neat it is, and you should go from stage one, two, three sleep, and then you go to deep sleep, and then REM, and then you repeat these cycles again. So in, in, in patient Parkinson's disease, this, this cycle kind of gets disturbed and fragmented. So you get less and less of this deep sleep. You, get, you, you have a lot of stage two sleep and, and stage one sleep, and you get a lot of arousal throughout the night. So that's, that's what we talk about fragmented sleep. So that fragmented sleep can lead to excessive daytime somnolence. So you're sleepy throughout the day. In addition to that, we think that some of the neurodegeneration that occurs in Parkinson's disease affect some of the uh, centers in the brain that produce the chemical transmitters that are needed for arousal and vigilance and so on. And, and it causes what we call a narcolepsy-like uh, like status or syndrome where patients will feel you know, easily kind of doze off and so on. And a specific type of this excessive day somnolence and, and sleepiness during, uh, in, during the day in Parkinson's disease is caused by medications, and it causes these sleep attacks. And that is one of the side effects of the dopamine agonists that we use. So there are multiple causes for these sleepiness during the day in patients with Parkinson's disease. So what can we do about it? Again, we go over the healthy sleep habits. We make sure the patient is sleeping well through the night. If there is anything that we can do to improve the patient's quality and quantity of sleep, we start with that. We uh, want to increase external stimulation during the day. So many times I get patients and you know coming in with their kids or their spouses and say, you know, he sits all day long and he watches TV and he's sleeping all day long. Yes, because there's really no no stimulation. There's no external stimulation. But you know, if you uh, play a game of chess or if you do some board games or if you I don't know, just go through the family photos or, you know, think about there could be a hundred projects that you can do, okay, that can keep you stimulated, keep you awake. I, you know, on the weekends when I sit in a chair and do nothing, I doze off, I sleep, there's no stimulation, there's no need for me to stay up. And remember, the homeostatic drive is working, right? So it will, it will make us go to sleep. So external stimulation is very important. And then exposure to light. Remember the circadian rhythm. Light is the strongest stimulus for wakefulness. Light is how our brain knows that this is daytime, and this is one, this is the strongest drive for our circadian rhythm. So many times, you know, I ask my patients, and their you know their house is dim. They have these big, huge trees. The sun never gets into the house. They don't, you know, they don't turn the lights on in the morning, the, the curtains are down, and that is a problem. You know, you really need to expose yourself to quite a bit of light during the day. And we actually use light as a therapy for patients who have excessive daytime sleepiness and for some sleep shift syndrome. So light is important. And, you know, work with your doctor, try to go over the medications, make sure that you are on the least possible sedative medications that make you sleepy during the day, and always think about safety precautions. So if there is excessive daytime sleepiness, if there are sleep attacks, you shouldn't drive, and you should be careful with your activity during the day that might put you or others in danger. All right, moving on. Parasomnias, so things that, you know, abnormal behaviors through the night. And out of those, REM behavior disorder is one of the common ones in Parkinson's disease, and one 
of the common disorders that precedes Parkinson's disease could be by decades. Not only Parkinson's, but a lot of the what we call neurodegenerative disease or alpha synecolopathy. So we see it in patients who, with Lewy body dementia and uh, patients with multisystem atrophy. And basically, to understand the, the, the physiology behind it, so like we said, during REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, basically we are paralyzed. Muscles are paralyzed, except for the muscles of the breathing and the eye moving muscles, okay? But arms and legs and so on, they really shouldn't move. And the, the, um, you know, the, the neurochemistry uh, people and neuroscientists found that there is this nucleus here, it's called the sublateral dorsal nucleus. So this is almost like a valve, okay? So this nucleus kind of prevents the, any signal going down to the muscles during REM sleep. So you can dream during REM of whatever you want to do. You're running in the forest, a lion running behind you, or you're running behind the lion, or you know, you're attacking someone, you're throwing a football, or whatever, whatever your dream is, your muscles are paralyzed. Your muscles are not moving. But if there is something wrong with this nucleus, if this valve is not working, if this valve is leaky, then these messages, these, these motor activities that you're thinking of, will get through and will go down to your muscles. So that's why patients with REM behavior disorder, they usually, you know, they will kick and fight and shout and run and scream and, and do all of these things because there is, there is a, a, a problem in, in this nucleus here. And um, so REM behavior disorder, like I said, can precede Parkinson's disease by many, many years, and it is present in Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative disease. When we do a sleep study, we expect that during REM sleep, we look at the, the muscles, we look at the EMG, the, the, the electrodes that we put on the chin and on, sometimes on the arm and the leg, on the muscle of the leg, during REM sleep, we expect that those, this activity will be flat. We get a flat line like this here. In patients who have REM behavior disorder, we continue to see muscle activity during REM sleep. So that's one of the keys, of course, other than the history. That's one of the ways that we know that this patient might have uh, RBD or REM behavior disorder. And here's some examples. I'll play the videos here for you in a second. So you see this karate chop, you're dreaming of, of something fighting or, or pushing someone away, and you can see that. And then this is the other video here. So, yeah, so as you can see, it's always, uh, you know, the patient is, is, is carrying out uh, a, a certain dream. They're just acting it out, okay? And if you wake that patient up and ask you what's going on, they, they will tell you. They'll give you, they'll tell you someone is running after me or I was trying to hit someone or stop someone or I was, uh, you know, playing football. I was, you know, defending or, or attacking or what have you. They'll, they'll give you some explanation of why were they doing this. And as you can see, they can be aggressive. I mean, that guy that hit the nightstand, he probably broke his hand. I mean, that was a really, you know, strong hit. And, and interestingly and characteristically, we really don't know why. The types of movement that you see in REM behavior disorder in patient Parkinson's disease are, they don't have the bradykinesia and they don't have the the, the, the rigidity. Did you see that, that, that hit? You know, that, <laughs> that was really fast. That was like a, you know, a black belt karate uh, guy. I mean, it's, so it's, it's very interesting that once that, that signal goes through, it, it doesn't follow the same disorders that we see 
in, in patients or the same type of wound that you see in patients with Parkinson's disease. So, um, so this is REM behavior disorder. What can we do about it? Well, safety first. As you can see, these can be, you know, uh, problematic, you know, patients can end up hurting themselves or their spouses or what have you. So you really need to think about, about the, the, the environment, the room, you know, you need to move away furniture that can, can hurt the, the patient. You need to, you know, put separate beds in the, in the bedroom. If, if, you know, like that other example, the patient that woke up, imagine if there was a spouse sitting right next to them or lying down there, they would have got a strong beating. Um, uh, so, you know, think about all of these things, you know, put pillows in between, uh, uh, lock, the, lock the room, lock, if you're on a second story, lock the windows, you know, in case someone is, you know, thinking of, uh, you know, running from someone and they go through the window. And these things have been reported and they do happen. So, so it is very important to think about these safety precautions, okay? And then... Um, and then uh, medications. So melatonin, we start with melatonin. It seems that it helps in many of these patients. You give uh, just a uh, over-the-counter dose of melatonin. Melatonin, you can start from like three milligrams. You can go up to 10 milligrams. And you give it, you know, uh, an hour or two before you go to bed. And that can hopefully suppress these uh, uh, RBDs. If it doesn't, we can use clonazepam, which is a benzodiazepine. We don't, again, the downside of clonazepam is that it lingers in your body and can make you sleepy and drowsy, but it is really very effective in suppressing these uh, RBDs. And if these REM behavior disorders are severe enough to cause these injuries and, and, and to be you know, threatening, then it is, I think it is a risk worth taking to put patients on, on, on clonazepam. All right, moving on, circadian rhythm disorders. We talked about this a little bit, that you know, patients can uh, start to wait, you know, go to sleep earlier and earlier, uh, you know, go to sleep at five or six and you know, cannot stay up for dinner or, and, and, then, and then wake up at you know, one or two in the morning and you know, don't know what to do. Uh, we use actigraphy to try to you know, look at that. We use sleep diaries. And uh, what helps with this is, again, we, we optimize their, their sleep habits. And then light can help quite a bit with this. Uh, you know, we try to have them exposed to light later in the afternoon or the evening. Four, at 4 or 5 p.m., we ask them to get more light. We can actually prescribe light. You can actually get, it's, you know, it's on Amazon. You can actually order a... Um, uh, uh, basically, a, a light uh, emitter that you can sit on, you know, uh, and for 30 minutes and so on, and that can help with the uh, kind of pushing that circadian rhythm more towards the evening rather than having that advanced sleep shift. Um, Restless leg syndrome and uh, periodic leg movements of sleep, uh, they are contrary to common belief, they are not. Uh, they are not more prevalent in patients with Parkinson's disease. Patients with Parkinson's disease do have them, but they are not uh, definitely, they don't have it more than the general population. And vice versa also, patients who do have restless leg movements and periodic leg movements of sleep do not necessarily have increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease. So they are kind of almost two separate problems that sometimes may coincide. Um, the, um, so... Restless leg syndrome is the characteristics of it is that it is it is more at night or in the evening uh, where patients get this kind of irresistible urge to move uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be movement they can actually complain of just some abnormal and and annoying sensation in their legs and it could be sometimes they describe it as creeping, crawling. Uh, uh, even sometimes pins and needles, so it's just some sort of an uncomfortable sensation in the legs. The, the key for the diagnosis is that it, it, it is relieved by walking or relieved by movement. So if they stand up, walk around, or just kind of like, you know, move their legs a little bit, then they, they feel better. That's how we diagnose restless leg syndrome. We don't really need a sleep study to diagnose restless leg syndrome, but it, it is frequently happens at night and during sleep. It can prevent patients from sleep or wake up patients, or patients will wake up with it, with this kind of annoying sensation in their legs. They have to get out of bed and walk around, and that gives them the reefs. That, that's how you make the diagnosis. Uh, periodic leg movements of sleep is this kind of rhythmic movements 
of the leg at night. And that periodic leg movements of sleep is, is common. A lot of people have it. And it's not necessarily a disorder unless it interferes with sleep, unless the pa patient starts waking up from it or having poor sleep from it, or they wake up in the morning feeling like their legs are tired as if they were walking all night long. And when we do the sleep studies, sometimes we see just unbelievable numbers of those. You know, you'd find a patient that have 120 of those an hour. So it is like you're walking all night long. You're just, you know, your legs are moving like this. And here's an example. You can go ahead and, and, and play that. Um, so, so this is periodic leg movements of sleep. Periodic leg movements of sleep, we do not treat it unless it is causing a problem. And uh, both periodic, and as you can see, this is that movement here, this kind of dorsiflexion of the toes or dorsiflexion of the foot. And, and that movement can go on and on and on. We can record hundreds of those through the night, okay? And they can also be as subtle as this or even less than that. It might be actually something that we only detect on the EMG, that, that we don't actually see a movement with it. Or it could be very prominent, like, you know, the, the, they, they, the covers are, you know, the, they push the covers away. So there's a variance in the amplitude and the frequency of, of these types of, of movement. And like I said, we don't treat them unless they cause problems for the patient. And the, num the first thing in the treatment, we check serum ferritin level. That's the iron storage in the body. And if it's low, then we have to bump it up because that can help. And then, um, and this is how it looks on the sleep study. So when we do a sleep study, we see these regular leg, you know, muscle movements, followed by an, an arousal, like here, for example. You see these kind of regular leg movements followed by that. Uh, and then they respond to some of the medications that we use for Parkinson's disease, like the dopamine agonists can control this, as well as gabapentin can also control that. All right, last is the obstructive sleep apnea in patients with uh, Parkinson's disease. It can get worse because they sleep on their back. They don't, they don't turn uh, that much. They have increased chest wall muscle rigidity. Um, and go ahead and play the video. It will give you a good uh, understanding of, of, the, of the problem. So here the patient pauses, no chest movement, no abdominal movement, and no air. So this is a central apnea. This patient, there's no signal from, for the brain for him to breathe. Now he started to breathe. He has his chest and abdomen movement. However, there's no air flow. There's nothing going on, okay? So he has an obstruction. There is no air going through, okay? Chest and abdomen movement, but no air going through until now, now the obstruction is relieved. He starts to take several breaths. And then the breath volume goes down. No, no breathing, no signal going on. Central apnea. And then he starts to move his abdomen and chest with no air going through. That's an obstructive apnea. And it, 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 it kind of hurts to see. I mean, if you hold your breath with him, you'll see how long, you know, it takes. And, and they go through hundreds of those through the night in, in patients with severe obstructive sleep apnea. And you can imagine all the deleterious effects that happen with it. So, and now he starts to breathe again. So what... What can we do about obstructive sleep apnea? It depends on how severe it is. So for mild obstructive sleep apnea, we ask the patient to sleep on their side. We ask them to lose weight. Uh, and then for uh, moderate obstructive sleep apnea, we can use CPAP, which is or a positive airway pressure, which is basically a device that delivers air under pressure to keep the airway open. We can, um, we, they can use oral mandibular devices, things that are custom made by the dentist. They put it in their mouth and it, it protrudes their jaw a little bit forward. That may work for patients who have kind of mild or maybe low moderate obstructive sleep apnea. 
And then there are surgical treatment for sleep apnea, or anywhere from just taking the tonsils out and repairing deviated septums to breaking the jaw and the maxilla and deforming the face again and, and opening up the airway. Um, there are actually nerve stimulators that have been introduced now for the tumor of sleep apnea that can, every time a patient stops breathing, it stimulates the hypoglossal nerve and the tongue protrudes, making uh, opening in the back. So there's a lot of treatments depending on the cause and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, needless to say, this is not good, you know, stopping breathing frequently. It affects, you know, patients with obstructive sleep apnea can have increased risk of cardiovascular disease for early death, strokes, dementia. Uh, it, it definitely is a, a definitely a, a bad health uh, uh, problem and, and um, and anyway, it needs to be uh, treated. So, so that's basically it. I just, uh, in this last hour or, or so, I went over the sleep physiology and, and how do we sleep and why is it important to sleep and how sleep deprivation, poor quality and quantity can affect uh, all kinds of functions in the body and, and, and especially with patients with Parkinson's disease. And I mentioned this in the last lecture, I'll mention it again, and uh, that, you know, I, um, I gave a talk like this before on the radio and my, my voice was very low. I didn't speak with intent as, and loudly enough. So when I went, after I finished the, 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 the radio talk, I went to listen to myself. And in about five minutes, I fell asleep. So, <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, so I thought about, so, oh, this is really bad. I mean, for, you know, to, to actually sleep on your own talk, that's pretty bad. Uh, but I thought of it in a positive way that, you know, either way, it's a good talk. I mean, it's a talk about sleep. So if you did sleep through my talk, that's perfectly fine. Either way, I think I got my message through. So thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ofeki. We're going to start the Q&A, and I'll be on this side of the room, and Leslie will be here. And just raise your hand and wait for the microphone. Okay, we'll start here. Okay, if someone is active in REM sleep, they're having a bad dream, bad experience, should you wake them? Yes. So yeah, we, we, that's a good question. We got that question the last time. Um, I guess ideally you have to observe and see if the patient is not, you know, in danger to themselves or others then they probably can, you can continue through it. Um, you may want to consider waking the patient if the patient looks distressed. I mean, if the patient is screaming and shouting and you know, kicking or punching or what have you, that's probably not a pleasant dream. And it might be helpful to wake the patient up just to, to, to end up that distress. Uh, but, the, but if it is maybe a, a subtle you know, movement or a subtle sound and it doesn't last long and it went away, there's probably no need to, to, to wake the patient up from that. You. Yeah, you're welcome. Can you have a sleep study done with a deep brain stimulator in place? Uh, um, yes, uh, you can. Um, uh, it might interfere with some of the EEG uh, uh, signal, uh, but Probably it can be done with you know some adjustments in the filters and things like that. You mentioned that DBS can help with um, sleep disorders yes. because it controls the symptoms better. Absolutely, yes. So DBS can help with sleep, so it controls the symptoms better. A lot of these motor uh, symptoms that we talked about can get under better control. It, it's also been shown that it helps with obstructive sleep apnea because, again, it improves the, the muscle tone of the nasopharynx and so on. So it does, it does help. You mentioned that with sleep apnea, losing some weight could help. Could you tell us what percent of body fat sure. or, or is there a certain percent that would, because yeah. you've said before that it can actually cure Yes. Sleep apnea. Yes, so definitely yeah, sleep, sleep, uh, weight loss can uh, uh, cure sleep apnea in, in, in many instances. So it, it is estimated that if you drop your body mass index by 10%, you drop your apnea hypopnea index by one third. So to give an example, we, we, we estimate the severity of sleep apnea based on the number of apneas 
And apnea is the no breathing part, is the, the, the complete cessation of breathing. We count those, and hypopnea is shallow breathing. So if you remember that patient, he would just have this shallow breathing and then he would stop. So we count those and then divide this by the number of hours the patient slept. And we come up with an index. It's called the apnea hypopnea index. Uh, less than 5 is normal, 5 to 15 is mild, 15 to 30 is moderate, and more than 30 is severe. So if we assume that someone's apnea hypopnea index is 30, and their body mass index is 40, for example, so if that patient reduced their body mass index by 10%, so they go from 40 to 36, their apnea hypopnea index will probably go down from 30 to 20, okay, reduced by about 30%. And so on. If they reduce, you know, four more percent, then it will go from 20 to 10. And four more percent or two more percent, it will go down to five or so. Uh, that's just kind of a general estimate. But yes, uh, losing weight can cure obstructive sleep apnea. In fact, patients who have bariatric surgery, patients who are overweight and they do, you know, significant weight reduction surgery, uh, can uh, don't have obstructive sleep apnea at all. We, we, you know, we test them after they lose their weight, and we find that their obstructive sleep apnea is gone. So, uh, yes, weight loss can help. Okay, here's one. How do you know if someone has dyskinesia or restless leg syndrome? Okay, that's that's a very good question. So yes, so so dyskinesias and, and tremors and abnormal movements through the night can be mistaken for restless leg syndrome. The key differentiating point is that relief with movement. Okay, so if the patient tells you that if I move, I get I feel better, that, that whatever that annoying restless sensation goes away then that's restless leg syndrome. If not, then that would be dyskinesia, could be akathisia, could be, could be a lot of other things. But that's, that's really the key differentiating point. Can you change your circadian rhythm? Yes. Uh, you know, you're... Um, so, patients that don't get exposed to light uh, can have uh, like a, they can have a sleep wake cycle that has nothing to do with the sleep uh, with the with the light and dark signal. Uh, we can use things uh, mainly light and melatonin to manipulate the circadian rhythm to or the sleep shift basically to make it delayed or to make it early. Because we we are definitely night people. Yeah. Seldom we get to bed before t one or two. Mm -hmm. Well, so so there's a there's an important thing to 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 realize here. So we a, a circadian rhythm disorder. The the in order for a circadian rhythm uh, change to become a disorder, it has to affect your life negatively in a way. Okay. So if you you know, cannot go to sleep until one or two in the morning. And then you have to wake up at, at five in the morning to go to work. Then that is a disorder. That is a problem. And we need to do something about it. But if your lifestyle would allow you to go to bed at one or two and then wake up at, you know, seven or eight, or, or, and, and you really don't have any problems waking up, you, don't, you feel refreshed when you wake up in the morning, you don't have any of that, then it is not a disorder. So part of what makes it disorder is, is really the, 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 the context that it's in. So for example, with our teenagers, for example, if you know, they go to bed at 2 or 3 in the morning, and you know, we allow them, they need 8, 9 hours of sleep, so we allow them to wake up at 11 or, or at noon, and they go start their, their, you know, their classes in the afternoon, if that is possible, it's not a disorder. You know, they, that's their physiology, you know? uh, but unfortunately it's not. So part of the social needs makes it a disorder. Thank yes. <laughs> right, right, exactly, yeah. But it, 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 to, to that point, though, I think it is, it, 
I think they overdo it. Uh, my daughter had her, a chemistry exam last night at 8 p.m. That was the time for the exam, which is complete. That's, that's the circadian dip. That's the, <laughs> the sleep window that I showed you earlier, you know. That's the peak homeostatic drive and the least circadian drive. So, worst time to have an exam. But anyway. And, oh, hold on one second. So is there a is one sleeping on one side of your body better to for you than sleeping on the other side? Yeah, there is. You know, there's some talk about that. There's really no good scientific evidence to suggest that one is is better than the other. Uh, you know, supposedly, you know, if you sleep on your right side, you allow better venous return to your heart and um, uh, and, and, you know, as compared to sleeping on the left side, I think that becomes an issue in pregnancy in, in you know, third trimester or so. We do, t you know, they do advise uh, pregnant uh, women at that time to sleep on the, try to sleep on the right side to increase the venous return to the heart and increase the, the perfusion to placenta and things like that. But not for, uh, not, in, in, in normal sleep. Now, there are certain, you know, like in obstructive sleep apnea, we don't, you know, we tell them not to sleep on their back. So, supine position worsens sleep apnea, for example, okay? So, um, yeah, so, it, but no, sleeping right or left, I don't think there's any, uh, any preference there. Okay. Uh, let's give Dr. Alfecki a round of applause. Yeah.